Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Dan Polisar to Kins and to Daytime Dialogues. To read his resume is really to just read a person who's a true scholar, a resume of a true academic and a scholar and a person who's been involved in real issues in the state of Israel. Uh, he has his PhD from Harvard University. He was a Truman and a Fulbright scholar there. In addition to it, he was one of the founders of the Shalem College, which was founded in 2013, and he's been serving as the executive vice president. He has served on committees in Knesset. He has lectured, he has written. He was also ed the editor-in-chief of the Journal Azure, which I fell in love with when it came out because of the quality of the articles that were there, and maybe one day we'll see it again. So there's a, so many things that he has contributed to the knowledge of Klal Yisrael, knowledge of Zionism, that it's a pleasure to welcome you. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rabbi Mitanki. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be on this podcast. Now, I, I have to give a little context, context for a moment. Uh, Dr. Polisar is in Yerushalayim at the moment. He has finished Tanita stairs. So if you see him drinking, don't get nervous. But at the very same time, he's not in Purim until tomorrow. So he's not missing McGill and he's not doing anything wrong on the fast day. But my voice may sound a little scratchy because I'm still fasting here in Chicago. I also heard there was a little bit of snow in Yerushalayim. There was going to be some snow. Someone told there was, me there was, supposed to, there was supposed to be some snow. Like, like snow many here. of these forecasts, they don't come out in the end. <laughs> So, okay, we, we, had our, we had our dose of snow for this year. We're ready to wait till next year. Weather forecasters have about the same averages as all-star baseball players, so it's okay. So, uh, Dr. Polis, I thank you. There's really a, a number of different issues I want to speak with you about. The first is really the issue of the Shalem College, which has graduated 200 students, has about 200 students. You mentioned to me right before we started that it's going to be expanding as well. And it's a liberal arts college which is a fascinating thing to start up nowadays because it looks like the whole world is moving away from liberal arts colleges. Um, I, Yeshiva University, Yeshiva College is a liberal arts college, and yet um, the business college has more students than the liberal arts portion. Why did you start Shalem? Okay, so the, the, I didn't start Shalem alone. I started Shalem as part of a group of people. And we had this conviction that Israel was in phenomenal shape in a host of ways. This dates back a decade and a half ago, even more. Uh, the country was strong economically, strong militarily, had remarkable solidarity within the society, uh, and also had a superb system of higher education. And yet we felt that the one piece that was missing was a liberal arts education. And by that, I mean, uh, in the way that the, the, the Greeks, the Romans, and others referred to it, artes liberales, those disciplines, that knowledge, those skills that are essential for free people who want to lead free societies. And in Israel, there's more of an emphasis in higher education on scholarship and on producing the next generation of scholars, which is extraordinarily important. But Israel very much needs to have great leaders, not just in politics, but in the rabbinate, in academia, in education, in journalism, in the business sector, in the uh, NGO sector. And we felt that given the experience in the Western world, uh, liberal arts education is the best way to give yourself a stream of people who have those abilities. So for people who are unfamiliar with a liberal arts education, if I compare it to a regular college experience in the United States today, what subjects would your students be studying or is it different than they would be having if they went to Yeshiva University, University of Illinois, any other school in the country? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not exactly, it's not, it's not that there are subjects studied at Shalem College that nowhere else in the world are they studied. They're only studying very particular liberal arts colleges, but rather liberal arts starts from, starts from an approach. What are we doing here? What's the purpose of this education? And the purpose of our education is to develop people who are going to become leading citizens of the country, people who have a sense of why they live where they do, what's the purpose of their own lives, what's the meaning of their lives, and what they can contribute to others. And that sense animates everything that we do. 
So you might study literature at a different place, not Shalem, not a liberal arts college, uh, and you'll study some of the same texts. You'll study Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and you'll study uh, you'll study Moby Dick, and you'll study uh, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, and a, and a range of works. But the question is, what's the purpose of doing? Typically, in a school where you're studying literature, you study all the literary techniques and all of the uh, details about how the book was written as it is and theories of interpretation. If you study uh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey at Shalem College, you're welcome to apply. And if so, you'll be studying it with all the other freshmen uh, in their first semester. You're looking at it to understand the genius of the Greek worldview and what it has to say to us today. And that's the approach that you'll take whether you're studying in the Bible class or in Greek philosophy or in Greek literature or in world history uh, or in great questions of uh, the natural sciences. I'm just uh, rattling off the first semester, part of what the students study in the first semester. So it's first of all about what's the approach? Why are you studying? Second has to do with how you're studying. We study here in what our Dean of the Faculty uh, Leon Cass, who hails from uh, the University of Chicago for decades, what he refers to as a wisdom-seeking approach. You're interrogating the texts not because you're smarter than the authors, and not because you know more because you come later, and not in order to point out what's wrong with it, but on the assumption that there's deep wisdom here, and you can learn from that and become a better person and a better scholar and a better leader if you really delve into that text from a sympathetic point of view. And so that's the second thing that's gonna make it different from what, might, what one might study, even if you're studying the same text in a different place. Uh, I'll just add one, one last uh, point to that, which is that it's also the breadth of what you study. Uh, typical education today in the world of higher ed is increasingly specialized. Focus more on your major, more on what you're going to do with this when you graduate. And at Shalem, we believe, yes, depth is important, but the depth is within the texts and the subjects you're studying. You also need to have the breadth. And so our students on the Jewish side will study everybody required, Bible, Talmud, rabbinic thought from the uh, medieval period, modern Jewish thought, modern Zionist thought. On the Western side, Greek philosophy, uh, Greek and Roman literature, modern philosophy, uh, Western literature, Christianity, Islam, and I could go on. The idea is these are the things that we would hope that the people leading our country and our people should know about, and we'd hope they develop the skills that you get and the appreciation and the understanding from delving deeply into those kinds of texts. And that's why I think it's different from other places that might study some of the same things. So using those goals, though, how do you move those students into roles that you hope will be roles of leadership? Is there something that propels them forward or is the thought that they naturally have these kinds of skills or, or talents and that's who you accept? So all of the above. We accept only about 50 students each year. So we hand select them from um, hundreds and hundreds of people throughout the state of Israel and even a small number from abroad who are interested in studying at Shalem. And we select them based on their academic ability, their ambitions to serve and to do great things, and our sense that they're people who will contribute and benefit from a Shalem education. So we start out with exceptional students. We then give them a program that is uh, eight full semesters and summers as well, uh, some of the summers. Um, and the idea is that the main thing that they need as leaders is not a set of techniques or certain gimmicks for how a leader is supposed to assert himself or influence others, but the main thing that leaders need is wisdom. And wisdom comes from learning the great ideas of Jewish civilization, of Western civilizations, from people who themselves care passionately about those things. So I think that they, during their years at Shalem, they develop a strong sense of knowledge and understanding, and I would think even deeper commitment. And then in addition to that, we actually work very closely with our students and with our alumni to help place them in the top positions that are available for people so young, just coming out of uh, the university. And so it's and a combination of choosing the right people 
helping them in their education and then placing them very actively. We're not, we're not ashamed to pick up the phone uh, to open doors for our graduates because we think that that's doing something good for whoever will hire them and for those graduates. So have you had those, that success? You've had five, six years of graduates. Are there people we can point to in Knesset and staffs of Knesset or other places in government or higher ed who are Shalem graduates? Yeah, so I have to, I have to say that at the, um, at the very beginning when I was recruiting the first class for Shalem, together with my colleagues, my role was to answer questions at the end of open houses and admissions days. And the question that was hardest to answer was, what am I going to do with this degree? And even as we had students the first few years, they hadn't yet graduated. And I gave the best answer I could about what we thought would happen with the students. Now, at those open houses, if I played the tape of everything I said at the time, I'd find all sorts of things that in retrospect, we were wrong about. This one we got right because we thought that our students would go into political life and we see them whether in positions working within the Knesset, working within the foreign ministry, many of them within the prime minister's office, within the security apparatus. We thought that they would go into education and in fact education is the leading field that our graduates go into, whether it's as uh, teaching in high schools, heading pre-army uh, academies, what are called mechinot gedam tzvayot, uh, in Israel or post-army programs, a host of very original things. We thought some would go into academia. They're going into academia um, in the most important areas that affect the public life of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. We're starting to see our graduates take on significant positions. None of them have been prime minister yet. We don't yet have Knesset members. And we think there are many, many important things outside of the political sphere. But given that our oldest graduates finished only five years ago, their impact already on Israeli society is uh, uh, inspiring to those of us who have been involved and have gotten to know them. Now, one of your areas of expertise is on Zionism, and, and it's um, one of those challenges, the ideology of Zionism, speaking from Chutzlar, it's from the diaspora, it's really a challenge because as someone once told me, how can you be in Mizrahi, which I am a proud member of a Mizrahi, you already succeeded. 75 years ago, so move on to your next challenge. Um, in Israel, Zionism is also a challenge, but it's also evolving. I, I mentioned uh, to you in a previous conversation, the phenomena that I'm watching of Haredi Zionism. Uh, most recently in the, in the, in the Zionist uh, elections for the WZO, there was a party that, that was formed called Eretz HaKodesh that's been getting a lot of press uh, over certain things they've been doing regarding the Kotel and other things that is aligned with hardcore Haredi members of, of Knesset, with uh, Haver Knesset Pindris, for example, is, is very involved in them. And we're watching members of the Haredi community getting involved in something that they would have stayed away from. I'm, I don't expect a, uh, an Israeli flag to be flying in the Beit Midrash in, uh, in Lakewood, but on the other hand, their involvement in these things is fascinating. Are you seeing that same kind of shift in the Haredi world towards some formal Zionism? I think it's one of the great stories of uh, Israel today is the degree to which Haredi society with all of the criticisms that people have of it and with all of the focus and the controversies is increasingly accepting of Israel as the Jewish state, as the national state of the Jewish people and increasingly integrated uh, within that, you see it especially in the workforce, but you see it in all kinds of educational enterprises, you see it in all kinds of political developments, and I think we have to see it in the context of the unbelievable success of Zionism. Right? The state of Israel is going to be celebrating its 71st, 75th birthday uh, just over a year from now. And over the last couple of years, you've seen as a sign of that success that in quarters where it was expected that they maybe would never come around to accepting the idea of Israel as a Jewish state, it's now becoming accepted. So let's start with the Abraham Accords, right? If somebody had told me 20 years ago that there would be Arab countries in the Gulf who would wanna have a warm peace with Israel and that they would be speaking about it in a very, very open way. They don't have a border with Israel. They didn't need Israel to trade any territory to them. All Israel had to give them was its partnership 
I would have said, not in my lifetime, certainly not in 20 years, maybe never. But the success of Israel has led countries like the United Arab Emirates and Morocco and Bahrain to come around and say, we want to be partners. So that's from one quarter. Look within Israel, Arab Israelis. Uh, there's a party in the Knesset today, in Israel's parliament, um, that is dedicated to the proposition that they accept Israel as it is, and they want to try to work within that system. There are lots of complications, and maybe it won't last, and maybe they're not entirely sincere. Right? There's lots of things you can be skeptical about, but the fact that the leading Arab-Israeli party is sitting in a coalition headed by uh, a prime minister who's a religious Zionist uh, indicates that Zionism has been incredibly successful, and people are coming to terms with that. Uh, obviously, the situation of the Haredim is very, very different, but I think there's also the same recognition. This state is here to stay. This state is an incredible success. The Haredim are a growing part of the population. They recognize that they have an increasing responsibility, and that will only grow as they become more of the population. And I think their integration is one of the great stories of the last couple of decades, and the continuation of that integration is one of the most important challenges that the state of Israel is facing in the coming decades. But I think you've put your finger on something of enormous importance. But if I look at the Haredi participation in, in Zionism, Haredi participation in the state of Israel, they seem to be two different pieces. Participation in the state of Israel is can be transactional. Um, mm -hmm. I'm doing this because I want to get this. Very, very political in ways. In Zionism, there's an element of ideology which seems to enter into it as well. Is it, have we crossed into that, that they see meaning in the state of Israel? Not asking for messianic, but some kind of, of meaning, religious or otherwise, in, in, in that Jewish state. So I'm not a part of the Haredi community. I'm very much a part of the religious Zionist community, and I don't want to pretend to expertise beyond what I have. But what I would say is the following. You're seeing in intellectual life, in academic life, in political life, even within the army, behaviors that clearly indicate something beyond a transactional relationship with the state of Israel on the part of the Haredi community. Now, if you push people in that community, and especially the leaders, to make declarations of uh, love for or an affinity for Israel as the modern Jewish state, you're not going to get that because ideologically within their community, that's not accepted. But they act in ways that can only be explained by something that goes above and beyond a transactional relationship. And I think it's essential to look at how they're acting. Right? The increasing number of Haredim who join the army, the increasing number of Haredim who are uh, joining the workforce, not just in technical areas, but in other areas as well. Uh, you see it in quietly in area after area. And ironically, the worst thing for it is when politicians start pushing and demanding because that almost forces the Haredim to step back and be oppositional. But if the process is allowed to continue with quiet encouragement, then I think we're going to continue seeing something that is of absolute essential nature for Israel's future. Well, you were identifying, I identify as religious Zionists. We know, however, religious Zionism in Israel is split. There are many flavors. There are two different parties in the Knesset, both who claim the mantle of religious Zionism. Um, I, many years ago at a Zionist Congress, I was sitting down and Yosef Burg Zatzal sat down next to me. For about 45 minutes, he was talking to me. I was. I was just mesmerized, but one of the things he told me about was Mizrahi was always the organization that was the bridge. We were always able to work and be able to be part. And at that time he was troubled because we had pulled out of the mainstream. Religious Zionism, are we gonna be part of that mainstream? Even the prime minister who identifies as a religious Zionist is not part of those two parties. Uh, and one of them, Tsiunuta Dati, the one that claimed the real name, uh, presents some real challenges for us as well. Do we have a place? Are we really going to be able to come together and regain a position? 
So I'm less concerned with whether there's one religious Zionist party, two religious Zionist parties, six religious Zionist parties. I don't think that ultimately it's those parties that are decisive. The way one can tell that religious Zionism is a strong and vibrant part of the country is if you look at the leading units within the Israeli army, a massive presence of uh, religious Zionists. Look at the universities, look at the high schools, look at who's teaching, look at who the business leaders are in the country. And religious Zionists are present in significant numbers in virtually every area that's important uh, to the Jewish state. And I think it is meaningful that the current prime minister is himself a religious Zionist. Uh, he was elected into the Knesset with votes, which I think in large part came from the religious Zionist community. And he was able to cobble together a pretty diverse coalition in part because he's somebody who has experience serving as a bridge between different constituencies. So I see this current moment as one that is part of the success of religious Zionism. Now it's not the biggest group in the country and it's not always a growing group and, and so on. And it doesn't have a party that always uh, maintains the same number of seats and the same ideology. But I think it's of the essence of religious Zionism to be a dynamic force. It combines different worldviews and you'll see it acting in different ways, but I, I, I very much see it as a, as a bridge and I see the current government as a reflection of that. It's fascinating. You're actually applying the same measure of success to religious Zionism as we had to Haredism. That let's look at what's happening versus what's being said. Let's look at let's look on the ground and see. And I, would, I, would, I would add. Look, my my um, my PhD is in political science, so maybe I shouldn't say the following. But I really don't think that politics is what defines the important things in the state of Israel. It's important for us to have good leaders. They should make wise decisions. They should be courageous and so on. But Israeli society is without regard to its political leadership, an unbelievable society in its dynamism, in its solidarity that people have with one another across party lines, across ideological lines. Just if you look in the area of education, the number of innovative institutions and types of institutions that have sprouted up in the last two decades is stunning. And religious Zionism is a part of that, uh, but other movements within and outside of Zionism are also a part of it. And so if you want to look for the strength of, of the country, I wouldn't get confused about what this or that party looks like or this or that politician. Israel's Leadership is strong in large part because the society is strong. Religious Zionism is strong because at its grassroots, it's got some as as large numbers of ideologically driven, smart, creative people who are blessed with a lot of avat Yisrael, love of their fellow Jews, and whoever happens to be sitting in the Knesset isn't going to make that better or worse. Now, you're also a scholar of Herzl, of Herzl's writings, Herzl's actions. Um, and it's interesting today, again, because so much of what happens in Israel, Herzl is that figure behind it. But in America, if I were to ask most of the, um, the students who are at my high school to give me a little bit more detail than Herzl having a long black beard, I'm not sure anymore if they would know, if they would know the name of the hotel in Basel on that porch, which... I went on that porch when I was in Basel because I had to see it. But, and I took one of those corny pictures that every other tourist does there just looking out. But if Herzl were to look at Medinat Yisrael today, would it be his success story? Would he, what would he see as the problems? So I usually don't answer questions about what great historical uh, figures would say today because I don't know, I'm not inside their heads, but I'm gonna make an exception for this one, not only out of respect for you, but because I think the answer is very clear. Herzl would look at the state of Israel today and consider it a stunning success story. I mean, what did he want? He wanted, a, he wanted the Jews to gather together and come out of their exile, especially from places where they're persecuted in Israel, kibbutz galuyot, the ingathering of the exiles has been phenomenal. Right. The Israel's Jewish population is, uh, by most 
ways of calculating it, the largest in the world, the diversity in the country is incredible. So he wanted a Jewish state. He believed that that Jewish state could spring up at a time that most people literally thought that he should be put in an insane asylum. There were people openly speaking about it in his community of Vienna, uh, that he was just completely crazy. He believed that state could arise. He believed the state could be a Jewish state. He believed the state could be a modern state. He believed the state would be an economic powerhouse. It was important to him that the Jews should learn how to defend themselves. It's a theme in his novels, in his diary, in his speeches, in all of his programmatic works. So if Herzl were to wake up today, at 118 years after, way, after he uh, passed away uh, at a very young age and look at the state of Israel, his first thought would be, this is exactly what I was hoping would happen. A state that is modern and Western and profoundly Jewish. It is particularist in its nationalism and it's universalist in the way that it treats the rest of the world. So overwhelmingly he'd be thrilled. Now, if you then asked him what could be, uh, what, what could be even better in the state, I'm sure he would point to certain things. I think he would hope that our educational system, which used to be world-class, and has slipped in uh, recent decades. I'm talking about the primary, middle school, and high school education. He would want us to be at the very top, and he would focus on that. And I think he would uh, look at the integration of different groups within the state of Israel and think that it's very good, but that uh, it could be made even better. I think he would want Israel to be even more of a conscious light unto the nations than it is. That was a big theme for Herzl, the idea that we would serve as a model. You see it in his Alt Neuland novel. You see it in his, um, in his book, Der Judenstaat, The Jewish State. Israel is a light unto the nations, but we're not always consciously making that effort. And he would want that to be something that we really wear out on our uh, foreheads. But Overall, I think that uh, I, overall, I think he would be thrilled with it. And I have to say that for Herzl, his monument is the state of Israel. I wish more people knew about the hotel and had taken the same kind of picture you did and could recite his biography because it's an inspiring story. But at the end of the day, I'm sitting in Jerusalem, the state that exists in large part because of Theodor Herzl, and Herzl never lived. I think it's unlikely, at least Derechateva, right, without an express, open, divine miracle, I think it's unlikely there would be a state of Israel. You can only say that about two other people, Ben-Gurion and Chaim Weizmann. But Herzl was the first of them. Without Herzl, there's no Ben-Gurion, there's no Weizmann. Uh, his state is his monument. In, in Israel today, do, do, does the average person see Herzl in that same way? Uh, no. The average person doesn't, and one of the reasons that I was happy to be part of the National Council for commemorating Theodor Herzl is that he had, for a variety of reasons, um, slipped almost below the radar. He was just not known, or he was considered too impractical to have built the state, or, or he was considered outlandish, or whatever other arguments people had. And so he didn't get and still doesn't get the credit that he deserves. And that's a, a black mark on all of us. The principle of Hakarat HaTov, being grateful to those who have done amazing things for us, is a very Jewish principle. The state of Israel has not fulfilled that as it should for Herzl. But at the end of the day, if Herzl were here, he might feel a little bit bad that he's been uh, outstripped by Ben-Gurion and in some circles by Yitzhak Rabin and in other circles by others, but he would say, I wanted there to be a state. I wanted there to be proud Jews in that state. I wanted it to be a modern state. It exists. I don't need more than that. So well, every, think, everything else is gravy. And I think in these recent weeks, we've seen a lot of that dream come true, even re with the Ukrainian refugees, the Ukrainian Jewish refugees, how Jaffe is on the ground, the Jewish Agency for Israel. They're on the ground. They're saving people. They're helping people. Those who want to come on Aliyah are able to come on Aliyah. And at the same time, Israel's setting up a field hospital. Little Israel is setting up a field hospital to help the whole population there. Uh, the, the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has driven home to Israelis many of the most core principles of Zionism, whether it's being a light unto the nations and how we treat the Ukrainians, whether it's absorbing uh, Jewish immigrants from there, 
or whether it's understanding why we have a state. I, I recently went to the graduation ceremony for the commander's course because one of my sons just finished uh, the commander's course for the Nahal infantry unit. And typically you hear these speeches that are boilerplate by the senior officers speaking to the young commanders, telling them all the things that they know about how you have to be focused on your mission and love your country and have value to it. Um, this one, the, the senior commander opened up by saying, you are new commanders of the Israel Defense Forces. It is your task to make sure that the fate of the Jewish people is not similar to the fate of the Ukrainian people. And everybody just stopped because that's exactly right. right? The story of Zionism is Jews have to be able to defend themselves as a collective in their homeland. And what's happening to the Ukrainians tragically is uh, clear evidence that we always have to be vigilant about that role and about that mission. And believe it or not, our time is up, but that's a perfect place to stop. I thank you so very much. You. Coming on Arab Purim for us, that message also is so very important. If we have to know that we have to stand up, we have to, in the Chutzlaretz, we have to stand up and support and teach. And in Israel, you have the opportunity to defend in ways that we can't imagine, but you've done so, such beautiful things in the school and in your teaching. And I thank you for everything, and especially for this last half hour. As I've mentioned before, this entire conversation is available also as an Apple podcast. And Dr. Palisar, thank you for your time. And I also want to thank our good friend, Stephanie Argaman Engelson, for making all of this possible as well. Have a wonderful evening and warm sameach tomorrow. You and, you and yours as well. Take care. Bye -bye.